Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, in our next video segment, we're going to do another comparison. This time it's going to be a little bit different. Um, a lot of you guys know that uh, the weaponry that I build and sell and deal with is primarily World War I and World War II. We're going to bump this up just a notch uh, and cover an area that's kind of controversial as far as firearms are concerned, and that's the uh, Korean War. And the Korean War, uh, basically there's very little known about it as small, as small arms, uh, primarily because there wasn't very much development in small arms between the end of World War II and the start of the Korean War. So therefore, a lot of the NATO, which was the newly formed conglomeration of uh, world leaders, uh, basically had to use surplus World War II weaponry. Now they did make advances as far as having uh, major developments in changing armor, artillery, and especially the Air Force with the jets, and even the Navy. But um, throughout the Korean War, the United States, Commonwealth countries, uh, you know, uh, even uh, some of our allies that chipped in and, and helped Australia and uh, New Zealand had to rely on World War II outdated weaponry. Now, the saving grace of that was that the enemy also had to rely on World War II weaponry as well. They didn't really have anything newly developed. Even the AK-47 hasn't really been used in prominence during the Korean War. They mostly relied on the, uh, the good old PPSH-41s, the PP-43s, uh, Tokarov rifles, China pitched in greatly with their amount of uh, surplus arms as well. They were even using the old water-cooled Maxims, uh, the Chinese Maxims. Well, uh, so if you think that during the Korean War, basically it was another extension of World War II, just the Allied lines had swapped around a little bit. Uh, the two weapons that I'm going to be introducing as far as what this comparison is, are so closely matched, I don't think anybody can have any discrepancies as far as the two that I've picked. One in the light machine gun configuration is the British Marin. Still in caliber 303 at that time, the uh, 308 NATO cartridge did not come about until after the Korean War in 1954. So they were still using the 303. And uh, up against that on the uh, Axis side or against uh, the communist Chinese and uh, Koreans was uh, a lot of the DP series that were just basically flooded over from World War II, uh, given to them free by Russia. Of course, Russia did supplement a lot of the arms that came out. Now, China did also have under contract a lot of arms that they were making that were copies and clones of the Russian arms, but Russia still, because they had new weapons coming under development, um, the RPD was coming into prominence. Uh, so they weren't really dealing those out. They were giving all the countries that they were supporting for the communist cause a lot of their surplus crap. So not to say that they weren't good arms. They were very good. They were giving them basically the, uh, the DP 27s, 28s, and the newly modified DPM. The DPM is the one that I'm going to counterpart against the Bren and stack it up against. And I'm going to, I think you're going to see that they're so closely matched uh, there's no two light machine guns that could be better compared in a comparison shootout. So um, they share a lot of the same uh, common traits, a lot of the design traits as well. They both shoot a rifle caliber. Uh, the Brent shooting the good old classic 303 rimmed cartridge. And the Russian uh, DPM is using the 7.62 by 54 rimmed round. Uh, the ballistics are almost identical on these. The effective combat range is almost identical as well. So, uh, some other prominence uh, shared between the two farms is they're both gas operated, open bolt operation, magazine fed, and uh, the weight is almost identical in them as well. So, uh, anyway, uh, one thing that I'd like to share also about the Bren and its exploits uh, that I've been able to find out and do some research on is that uh, especially the Canadians, the Canadians used a lot of the Brins during the Korean War 
uh, so did the Australians and New Zealands, but there was one particular battle that really stood out in prominence with the Bren machine gun, and that was the Battle of Cap Yon in uh, April of 1951. Uh, there was a, uh, a private, I think his name was Wayne Mitchell, and he was uh, a private in the company, he was a Bren machine gunner, and with the Canadian 2nd uh, Battalion Light Infantry. And in one, this one skirmish battle that they had, this one young man held off almost 400 mad screaming Chinese soldiers in assault after assault with his Bren gun. Had it not been for his Bren, they easily would have been overrun. There was just one company against 400. And they did hold out for several days until uh, the UK did uh, back them up and send in reinforcements and save the day. So anyway, uh, if you get a chance, look up some more about this young man. He uh, received countless medals, and I'm not sure if he has, he did survive the war. I'm not sure if he has any kind of uh, biographies or autobiographies out there on his exploits, but uh, he and his Bren proved very essential in uh, helping to support uh, countless uh, charges and, and uh, nighttime hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So anyway, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get started and show you um, the comparisons and we're going to do kind of a grade scale, kind of like I did on the other comparison videos, just a little bit different twist. Instead of giving a point average, which really confused a lot of guys, uh, we're just going to basically say either this gun has the advantage or this gun doesn't have the advantage. And uh, I'll edit it to where it actually makes more sense than what it did with the uh, comparison between the SG-43 and the uh, MG-42. Also, we're going to do a little bit accuracy testing as far as uh, shooting uh, some water jugs. One actually holds the better uh, in uh, combat effectiveness as far as being able to hit their targets. So anyway, I hope you all enjoy this and uh, let's get started. Okay, as you can see, the uh, magazine chest for the DPM and the DP series machine guns uh, used a metal transit chest held three 47 round mag pan magazines that's only 141 rounds total to be carried in that one transit chest here on the right hand side we have a 12 count Bren chest held 12 30 round magazines that's a total of 360 rounds that could be carried. Of course the individual gunners and the assistant gunners also had magazine pouches on them that they carried. Usually the magazine pouch held two or three mags uh, for the uh, British Bren and there was kind of a cloth bag that held two or three mags that the gunner or assistant gunner would carry. Of course the British Bren mags are a lot more smaller. Uh, of course the capacity is also smaller but they're a lot easier to carry. Okay if we take a closer look at the Bren magazine. Box magazine it's curved in order to uh, allow stacked the British 303 round and it is a rimmed round as is the uh, DPM 7.62 by 54 now you would think that the British Bren would be a lot quicker and easier to load than the DP series mags well it is but it's not as quick as you think and it also has a complication issue because of the rimmed cartridge and that is that the rounds that are stripped from the box magazine have to actually be stacked in front of each other so you have to be very careful and stack each one of these rims in front of the other one in order for the cartridge to be stripped easily uh, a lot of jams have happened and especially in the heat of battle and battlefield conditions that gunners or assistant gunners or even uh, soldiers in the rear echelon positions have loaded these mags wrong and caused feed jams uh, jeopardizing the lives of the, the gunner. 
So what you have to do very carefully, or at least be knowledgeable of it, is that one rim has to fit in front of the other rim when you push it in, just like that. If it's not, it will cause a jam because the lip of that rim is going to catch on the previous round and not go in place and it's not going to be stripped. So you can see that especially at night conditions that you had to be very knowledgeable and careful that you loaded these correctly or you could put the gun out of action. Okay on the DP series of course a lot of the mags had to be actually loaded either in the rear areas and uh, carried to the front or if the uh, the gunner or assistant gunner or number two man actually had to load one of these mags it's very time consuming you have this little d-ring here on top that you basically have to uh, hook your finger into and then uh, as you're pulling that d-ring around it actually winds up that spring and allows you to insert another cartridge so at 47 rounds even though you have a lot more uh, rounds at your uh, disposal it's also a lot harder to load them a lot more time consuming and you can imagine especially just like the Brin situation trying to load one of these at night in the heat of battle of course you don't have the problem that you have with the double stack magazine configuration in the Brin it causing a problem with the uh, rim cartridge catching on the previous one you don't have that but it is a lot slower to load than the Brin magazine also an advantage with the Brin box magazine is that you can disassemble it if uh, there's grit or something or dirt down inside of it that you have to uh, extract or clean it out you press this little button here in the bottom you can slide this bottom floor plate out the spring and the follower come out and you can flush it out with the DP series you can't you remove this one top screw here that holds in that spring plus there's a follower inside that has a small spring and a uh, little threaded portion to it that this screw here goes to for the D-ring you remove that and the follower then basically is free to spin and uh, kind of all hell breaks loose it's almost next to impossible to ever get that spring back to the correct tension now you can get the magazine back together but believe me the spring tension you'll never get it right for ease of loading the magazine in field conditions the Bren has the advantage The brand light machine gun is select fire, the fire selector to the back for R for repetitive, straight down in the middle S for safe, and forward A is marked for automatic. The DPM does not have select fire capability. Select fire capability, the British Bren has the advantage. The Bren light machine gun does have accessibility for a tripod mounting here in the front and also a point in the back right here. The DPM does not have tripod accessibility and there never was one made for it. For tripod accessibility, the British Bren has the advantage. The DPM does have an adjustable gas system, however, you have to remove a small split pin, pull the gas regulator forward, rotate it, push it back into place, and reinstall the split pin. It does have multiple gas settings, it's just a lot harder in the field and under battlefield conditions to change it. The Bren does have an excellent gas adjustment system. Just simply unlock the barrel, pull the barrel forward, and on the back side there's a small little lever that you can actually adjust the gas by hand 
to the next setting, which aligns with these two dots here. You have four gas adjustment settings. Slide it back in place and lock the barrel in. On versatility of gas adjustment settings, the British Brin has the advantage. The DPM does have an excellent barrel change action. Simply pressing in this button here on the receiver, rotating the barrel up and pulling it free. It uses the interrupted threads much like the Brin. Reinstall, pressing in the button on the side of the receiver. Rotating the barrel down till it locks in place. To remove the barrel on the Brin, you have a latch locking collar here. Has a little spring-loaded latch here on the bottom. Depress that, roll it up, and simply pull the barrel forward and off. The barrel's locked in place by a set of interrupted threads inside the receiver. Place it back in, simply slide it in forward, and lock it back in place. Easy accessibility for the quick change barrel, tie. The Brin also has an excellent carry handle attached to the barrel, can be raised up and used to remove a very hot barrel. Also, it has a small little spring-loaded detent inside, can be pulled forward, rotated, and be used to hold the weapon in assault firing positions. And it folds easily out of the way of line of sight. Okay guys, first thing I'd like to show you is the loading sequences between these two light machine guns. I think the Brin has the advantage here basically because with the bolt in the closed position uh, you can still insert the mag just like that. And like I said before it actually is a lot easier to manipulate one-handed. has the little catch here on the front and then a lock uh, cliff here on the back where just you just insert the front of it, catch it inside its little uh, recess, and then just rock it back just like you do an AK mag. And basically it just has one single little uh, spring-loaded catch mechanism here. And it does have the last round bolt hold open device so that whenever you insert a mag and resume firing you don't have to charge the weapon again. But it's real handy to be able to load and have a loaded magazine on a closed bolt, especially on an open bolt gun. It's just an extra sa uh, added safety. Okay, the magazine sequence for the DPM and the DP series in general, just a little bit more difficult. What you have here is a, uh, a set of little uh, twin forks here, two little uh, pieces of metal tab that stick out, and then in the back you have a small little flat piece of metal. So what you have to do is you have to, uh, basically, let me zoom in here, see that little piece right there? Those two little fork pieces has to fit in underneath that little ledge that recess exactly right in order for that mag to catch. So let's see if I can show that right there like that. And then the downside to all of this is the mag has to be loaded into the weapon after the charging handle is charged back. That's the downside. So basically, you have to have the bolt charged back, and then the magazine can fit in the back, and then you just simply press down on the back until it locks in place. Now what is ingenious that the Russians made is that uh, this whole rear sight housing here is actually the mag release. It's a little spring-loaded endeavor here on a, with a single screw that goes through and attaches to the receiver. So you basically pull the whole housing backward and then lift the magazine off. Now it's still hard to do basically uh, one-handed and that's why some machine gun crews did have two or three men actually that helped. That was also the case with the Brin, but if you were separated or your other crew members were killed off and you were on your own, the uh, DPM is a lot harder to load uh, single-handedly.
Okay, let's try it and see how well it manipulates single-handedly with a single gunner and doing a mag swap out and see how hard it is for an individual to do that. Alright, from the firing position, that's basically lower the weapon down, pull back on the mag release, take one out. You have to make sure those two forks are stabbed exactly in the front and back up again and you're ready to fire. It's not the easiest. Alright, now let's try the same thing in the firing position, one-handed with the Brin. From the firing position, that's all there is to it. For ease of loading the magazine in field conditions, the Bren has the advantage. For better long-range sights, the Bren has the advantage.